Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, certainly it is a privilege and honor to be here. I always consider it a privilege and honor anytime I'm given the opportunity to be uh, with the members of the body of Christ. Um, I would first like to again say to you that I wouldn't be here this morning if it wasn't for my dear friend, uh, Dr. David Barnes. I am, um, you're going to find in the next 15 minutes, I'm probably more sensitive than the average guy because I think um, dovetailing off of Michael, I've had a lot of different living experiences that have caused me to have a very, very deep appreciation for the relationship that the Lord has blessed me to have with him. I grew up on a military base. Um, I'm from Southern California. My father was in the Marine Corps and served 30 years there. And my mother worked for the state of California. And so in my family, I, I, I learned two different key principles, I believe, that you have to have to be successful in life. My father was a strong disciplinarian, but my mother knew how to nurture us and love on us. And, and I think the combination of both those relationships have become a part of my DNA. The scripture that, that comes to my mind that I'd like to share this morning is, is Isaiah 44 and 2. The Word of God tells us there that when, when God chose uh, or was speaking through Isaiah to the nation of Israel, he talked to them about being formed in, the, in, the, in your mother's womb. And after being formed, were chosen. And I was thinking a lot about what Michael was sharing, and it, and, it, and it was touching and ministering to me, because one of the things that I've tried to understand in my life, as I've sought the Lord many times for the experiences that he's allowed me to have, was, God, you tell me in your word that you formed me in my mother's womb. You also tell me, Lord, that you chose me. And as I live, I've lived my life and I thought about what those things represent, I'm going to share with you a few snapshots that have happened in my life and hopefully they'll bless you the way they've blessed me. Before I do that, I'd like to say that to Brian Coughlin. You know, Brian, um, I was sharing with Dr. Barnes when we, we came in here. The Word of God says that one plants, another waters, God gives the increase. And what I love about this morning are all the tables that are here. Because I believe by faith that in the near future, this place will be overflowing. It's going to be overflowing with the presence and the Spirit of God and the testimony that's going to come out of this room. I believe that that's a part of what my mother and father birthed in me as well. You know, when I was five years old, I had a very, very interesting experience. I'm 56 now. So a lot of my life experiences go back and I look back at 50 years of my life. And I think about the things that my parents taught me. And one of my early lessons in life was an experience that I had in kindergarten. And in my kindergarten experience, you know, this little boy, I was riding a tricycle and he wanted to get on the tricycle. But, you know, I didn't let him get on the tricycle because I was having fun. And I used to have this money shirt. It had nickels, dimes, and quarters on it. It was, by the way, royal blue. And so, you know, I had my shirt off. I was in 29 Palms, California. And this is my first experience of having something that didn't make sense to me. So obviously the boy called me a name that I won't, the N-word. And, um, you know, I didn't know what it meant because um, we just didn't talk that way. That wasn't something that I had ever learned, that it was ever spoken to me, that was ever shared. I remember this experience so distinctive, distinctively because me and the little boy ended up having a fight. My parents had to come to the school and my father and mother sat me down and asked me if I had any questions. And I remember asking my mother, well, what does the word or what did the word mean? My parents never defined the word. My parents simply said this, that's not who you are. And so sometimes when I think about how the Lord said he formed me in my mother's womb and he chose me, he chose my parents. And, I, and I, I'm so grateful for that beginning experience that I had at five years old because my mother and father sat me down and they said, whatever that word is, that's not who you are. But they didn't just stop right there. They didn't stop by saying to me, that's not who you are. They began to speak into me and tell me who I was. They said, your name is Thaddeus Bosley Jr. Your grandfather on your mother's side, he owned oil and gasoline. You come from a multicultural family. 
And if you go back and you do the history of those things that you come from, you have Anglo-Saxon in you, you have French in you, you have Native American in you, you have Chinese in you. But most importantly, son, because I'm a Christian and your mother's a Christian, you have Jesus in you. And so from the time that I was five years old, as early as I could remember, I've always been around Christianity. I remember my grandfather, who at Thanksgiving would sit us down, and as a family, as the patriarch and the matriarch, my grandmother, would lead our Thanksgiving prayer. Because my father was in the military, we didn't have the opportunity to see my grandfather on an annual basis. So the times that I was able to see my grandfather were great opportunities. But what I loved the most about my grandfather was how I heard my grandfather call out to the God of heaven and earth and thank him for giving him the opportunity to live in this country. And thank him for giving him and making him one of the first contractors in Little Rock, Arkansas. For giving him the ability to build his hands, his home, with his own hands and with his four sons and for in thanking him for every grandchildren every grandchild and every great grandchild that he was able to talk to about Jesus Jesus knew that when he formed me in my mother's womb Jesus knew that when he chose me and I will never forget the lessons that I learned and the conversations I was blessed to have talking with my grandfather. The other day, I was fortunate and blessed enough with Brian and with Michael to be a part of the FCA clinic. And there was a little boy there, and he obviously never played baseball before because he was hitting with like Ty Cobb with a split grip. <laughs> Not the Ty Cobb who was one of the greatest players that ever lived and didn't know what a split grip was, but this young man didn't know what a split grip was. His hands were separated. He didn't know where to hold his hands. He didn't know how to stand. And all the other kids in his group were very good baseball players. And his countenance was beginning to fall and he was becoming disgruntled. And you could see he just didn't want to participate anymore. And so I put my arms around him and I said to him, you're gonna be a very, very good baseball player one day. Never give up and always keep your chin up and put a smile on your face. I learned that at five years old when my father taught me in my kindergarten experience how to handle a situation. Had I not had that experience with my father at five years old, I couldn't have put my arms around that little boy when he, he felt rejected or dejected or wasn't accomplishing his goal. But the beautiful part about the story that I'm sharing with you right now is he smiled. And before the day was over, we played a game. And when he had his time to at bat, he got a hit. And he was running down first base and he was having a beautiful moment. Well, you know, as Christians, sometimes that happens for us. We'll have experiences in our lives where we just don't know how to hold the bat. We just don't know how to get the grip. We just don't know what kind of stance to take. We don't understand what the moment is gonna be from moment by moment, but by the grace of God and the favor of God, we're able to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And then God enables us to have a living experience that blesses us and causes us to be a blessing to others. One of the things that I love so much about this morning is what FCA stands, stands for. And it stands for, for me, the fellowship. I remember when I was drafted out of high school, and in 1975, I was drafted in 1974, but in 1975, I was going to spring training and I was going to A ball. And we were driving to uh, Davenport, Iowa. I had just filled the car up and put gas in it and was coming on to the on ramp. And for some reason, the car hydroplaned. And I end up rolling a 240Z four times. My head landed outside of the driver's side window. Before I filled the car up with gas, because it was freezing cold, I had a thermal sweatshirt on and I tied it up around my neck. And didn't, finally, you know, thought that was kind of odd that I didn't take it off when I got back in the car. But the Lord knew, the same God that formed me in my mother's womb, 
The same God that has chosen me to stand before you today knew that I was going to have that living experience. Long story short, I ended up having a broken neck in three places. I cracked my third, fifth, and seventh vertebra. And I don't know it. I go to sleep. I get up the next day. I carry luggage. The California Angels who drafted me out of high school sent out an APB. We get to Salt Lake City. They say, Thad, is, you know, is there anything that you feel? Are you okay? My friend Steve Brisbane, who was in the car with me, he's fine, but I can't move my neck. They take me to the doctor. I get x-rayed. We go back to the ballpark, and I'm sitting there, and four players and the uh, trainer rush me and say, don't move. They lift me up. They put me on one of those slabs. The ambulance comes, and they rush me to the hospital. The doctor comes in, and he says to me, I don't understand how you're walking. I don't even understand how you have any mobility. And I'm saying, doctor, what are you talking about? He said, well, when you crack your third, fifth, and seventh vertebra, you're not supposed to have any type of movements in your arms, and usually you end up becoming a paraplegic or quadriplegic based on the extent that we see in the x-rays of your injury. And we're going to cast you up. And eight weeks from now, we'll kind of come back and reevaluate you. But I want to tell you right here and now, you're going to have to do something different. And with simple childlike faith, that looking back in retrospect, I didn't know what the Lord was saying through me. I said, Doctor, I don't believe that that's God's will for my life. Five weeks later, I go in for an eval. And so they x-ray me, and they don't find anything. The doctor says, there must be something wrong. X-ray you him again. Long story short, they x-ray me over and over again. They can't find anything. Because my mother went, cried out to God, stood before a congregation. And the Lord healed me. I know, but for the grace of God, I don't stand here today. I don't. I don't play 14 major league seasons. I don't do that. I don't have those experiences that I could share with my two sons. I was so blessed by Michael's testimony because I prayed the whole time saying, Lord, what are you going to give me to share? And he kept saying, Talk about living in the moment and how important living in the moment is. And that has been the central theme of my life after my accident. Each day I wake up, I thank God with all of my heart for the opportunity to breathe the breath of life. Because each moment we don't know, moment by moment, whose life you can affect. I remember being 20 years old and Nolan Ryan was on the mound on June 29th, 1977. That was my first game in the major leagues. Andy Etcheberry was catching. Barry Bonds' father, Bobby Bonds, was playing right field. Don Baylor was playing left. After that injury, the Lord blessed me. He blessed me to win a batting title in 1976 in A-ball. He blessed me to steal 90 bases. He blessed me to be the most valuable player in the California Angel organization. He blessed me to be the number one prospect. He blessed me to be one of the only players in Major League history to get a two-year Major League contract coming out of A-ball. He blessed me to play with some of the greatest men in the history of baseball. He blessed me to have Frank Robinson, Larry Doby Sr. I'm talking to the baseball people in the room. Harvey Kuhn, Veda Penson, Alano Sopeza, and Billy Williams as hitting coaches. He's blessed me in ways that I would never imagine, ask, or think. But in the midst of that, like Brian, I had a blood clot in my leg the size of a grapefruit my rookie year in the major leagues. I went from running a 9-700 or running down the first base at 3-8 to running 4-4. My career changed from being an everyday player to a utility player. 
And I cried out my whole baseball career, Lord, why won't you allow me to get back on the field? And God kept teaching me what he's taught me today, the importance of living in the moment, the importance of appreciating every day and living one day at a time. I'll share the story that Dr. Barnes is familiar with as one of the greatest stories that I've experienced in my living experience. In 1984, I'm on the Chicago Cubs. We're fighting for a pennant race. And I had reconstruction surgery in my wrist in 1981 um, because I, I checked swing on a Flanagan curveball and I, I popped my tendon, didn't know it. For a year and a half, because my father was a drill instructor in Special Forces, he always talked to us about a high, having a high tolerance of pain. So I'm playing for a year and a half, and I've got a tendon going up my elbow, and every time I comb my hair, I have excruciating pain, but I keep hearing my father in the back of my head saying, come on, son, you can do it, come on, son, you can do it, and even though my dad wasn't there. So finally, a year and a half later, I can't take the pain anymore. And so, you know, I go to the trainer, and I go, listen, I can't take this pain anymore, we've got to do something. They go in and do an exploratory surgery, and they find out that the tendon is going up my elbow, so they take the tendon out of my fourth toe, reconstruct my wrist, and it, gives, it, it extends my career. So now I'm on the Cubs in 1984. We're fighting for a playoff spot, and we, we play a series before that in San Francisco. I slide into third base on a triple, and oh, by the way, pow, there goes my wrist. Now, this is during the time that I'm leading the National League in pinch hits. And we the next series we're about to play is against the New York Mets. So we're playing the Cincinnati Reds on a Sunday. And Jim Fry never hits me before the seventh inning. Because, you know, I'm the last guy that's going to pinch hit. So he thinks, okay, I'm going to save that. He's going to help us. You know, and, you, know, you know how that works in baseball, the baseball people in the room. So here's the long story short. I go to chapel that Sunday morning, and I'm disgruntled. For seven years in my major league career, I can't get back on the field. And no matter what I'm trying to do, I can't get on the field. I can go two for four, I can hit two home runs in the, in the seats, I can have five ribbies, I can throw someone out, but I can't get on the field every day. And I'm so frustrated that, honestly, I'm thinking about quitting. I'm crying out to God. I pack my suitcases and go, you know what, Lord? It must be your will for me to leave. So now I want to play God. And so what ends up happening is that um, I go to chapel, and the gentleman who's leading the chapel says, there's two things that will always change your life. And I'll close with this. The books you read and the people you meet. And he kept repeating that. The books you read and the people you meet. And so... After chapel, I go to find the pastor, and I said, Pastor, can I please talk to you? I said, I'm really struggling. And my baseball career and my life hasn't gone the way that I wanted it to go. And I feel like I don't know what to do. I don't know my next step. And he said, exactly like the Lord led me this morning, that I want to say this to you. You have to learn how to live in the moment. And it's always going to be the books you read and the people you meet. Well, I go up to, we're in the ball game, the sixth inning, we're losing. Pete Rose is the manager of the Cincinnati Reds. He brings Jeff Russell out in the sixth inning. Jim Fry sees that. He changes our pitcher, and he goes, Boz, get a bat. Now, in, in batting practice that day, I didn't take any swings. I told the trainer, please, man, I, don't, I can't hit today. Don't tell, you know, we called him preacher man. Jim Fry said, don't tell the preacher man. Because every time we, had, we were losing during that season, he'd come out and preach like a 15-minute service to a sermon to us before the game started. So I said, please don't tell preacher man, because, you know, I, I, I can't hit today. Well, he didn't tell him that. It's the sixth inning. We have two runners on. Jeff Ru Russell comes out throwing 93-95. Now I've got to go up there and try to hit this guy. And this is how God will get you out of yourself. So here's what happens. I get to the uh, deck circle. I don't swing. I can't swing. I, I take my, I'm a left-handed hitter, so I take my right hand, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to take all the time, put my bat in gloves. I'm trying to be as slow as I can. And I walk up to the plate, and usually when I walk up to the plate, I would bow my head and say, in Jesus' name. And so I get in the batter's box, and I'm standing there, and I say another prayer. Lord, please help me. First pitch, 93 miles an hour, inside part of the fastball, ball one. I step out of the batter's box, and I go, in Jesus' name. And then I step into the batter's box, and I feel this nice, calm feeling. Everything in the stadium goes away. I don't hear anything. 
Here comes Jess R Russell again, 93, 95. And the next thing I know, my bat goes through the hitting area. But before my bat goes through the hitting area, I feel this little touch on my shoulder. Now, this is a true living experience that I've had. When I look up, the ball's going into the second deck. I can't even feel myself. I, never re I don't remember to this day touching first base. I don't remember touching second base. I don't remember touching third base. I don't even remember touching home plate. All I remember was jogging to the dugout and watching my teammates do this. But I don't hear them. And I'm so stunned with what I've experienced that I go sit by myself. So they're patting me on the shoulder and I go sit by myself and I, I'm just, I'm looking up where the ball went. And I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, live in the moment, trust me. As Jeremiah 29 says, I know the thoughts. I think toward you, saith the Lord. His thoughts are always good toward us. Again, I'm honored. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And may God bless you. May God bless FCA.